What's up, peers, and welcome to the World Crypto Network. You're continuing the reading of the Ethics of Money production by Jörg Guido Holtzmann. Thank you very much for writing it and for the Mises Institute for publishing it. Uh, today, Chapter 2 on Money Certificates, Part 1, Certificates Physically Integrated with Money. The precious metals would have become monies even if coinage had never been invented. Because even in the form of billion, their physical advantage outweighs those of all alternatives. There is, however, no doubt that coinage added the benefits derived from indirect exchange, and that it therefore contributed to the, spending, uh, to the spreading of monetary exchange. Coinage allows the exchange of precious metals without engaging in labor-intensive processing of weighing the metals and melting it down. On one can determine the metal weight simply by counting the coins. See Aristotle in Politics. Coinage endows a mass of precious metals with an imprint that certifies its weight. The typical imprint says something to the effect that the coin weight of total or so and so many grams or ounces grows weight with this or that uh, proportion of absolute content of precious metal, the fine weight. This is why coin names were typically the names of weight, for example, the pound, the mark, the franc, the iku. Notice the, that the service depends entirely on the trustworthiness of the certifier, that is, of the minter. If the market participants cannot trust the certificate, they will rather do without the coin and go altogether to try uh, to the extra trouble of weighing the metals and possibly melting it down by determining its confinements of fine metals. A trustworthy coin economizes one uh, on this trouble and thus adds the value of the bulletin contained in a coin. For example, a trustworthy one ounce silver coin is more valuable than a one ounce silver bullion. An earlier writer who stressed this fact was Nicholas Copernicus. Uh, see his treatise De la Monnaie. My French aunt, excellent. People therefore pay higher prices for coins than for bullions, and the minter lives off this price margin. Because of the value, no. Most historical coins have been fabricated in government mints. This has misled people into believing that the superior value of coins as compared to bullions de demonstrated that the legal sanctioning of a coin is the source of its superior value as compared to bullion. For example, the ancient Greeks called money nuomisma uh, from nomos, the law, and at the beginning of the 20th century, the German professor Knapp popularized what he called the state theory of money. The idea that government fiat was a source of value has inspired many extravagant theories and political schemes. As we shall see, the truth is that government enforced legalization can provide a few privileged coin makers with monopoly rent. But this has nothing to do with coinage per se. Even without any legal sanction, trustworthy coins are more valuable than bullion. This value difference springs, as we have seen, from the service of certificates. Historically, private coinage came first, and only later did governments take over. See Arthur Burns, Money and Monetary Policy in Early Times. Because the value of the certificate depends on the trustworthiness of the minter, the coins are typically used within limited geographical areas. Only the people who know the minter are likely to accept his coin. All others will insist on being paid in bullion or in the coins they trust. This does not mean that in practice every village needs a different set of coins. The geographical radius which with which, within which a coin is used can grow very large, and it even be, can become a world encompassing if the minter has an excellent reputation. This was, for example, the case with the Mexican dollar coins in the early 19th century. 
circulated freely in most parts of the US and which have bequeathed their name to the present day currency of this country. Historically, minters have offered additional services that complement the certification of weights. Thus, one of the pre perennial problems of coining precious metals is that used coins might contain a smaller quantity of precious metals than freshly minted coins. If this happens, people are inclined to hold back the good coins for themselves and to trade only the bad coins. To overcome this problem, minters could offer their coins in combination with an insurance service. They could offer to exchange any slight, slightly used coins against a new one. This policy would guarantee the stability and homogeneity of the coinage through time. Thus, the insured coin would trade at even higher prices, which prices different differential, the premium, the, respect, the replacement expenses can be paid. A great number of monetary thinkers from the Middle Ages to our times have held that coinage should be entrusted uh, to the price of governments, to the uh, princes or governments, who, because they are the natural leaders of society, were also the people to be naturally trusted. The medieval scholastics knew full well that the princes frequently abused this trust placing, for example, an imprint of one ounce on a coin that contained merely half an ounce, pocketing the other half on the other half of an ounce for themselves. Therefore, Nicholas Eresmi postulated that the princes did not have the right to alter the coins at all unless they had the consent of the entire community, that is, the entire community of money users. Economic science has put us in the position to understand that competition, competitive coinage is an even better way of preserving the trustworthiness of coins. There is no economic reason not to allow every private citizen to enter the minting businesses and to offer his own coins. It is true that a private minter too might abuse the trust his customers put in him and his coins but punishment is immediate. He will lose all these customers. People will start using other coins issued by people they have reasons to trust. In other ways, this competitive process also fulfills Erasmus' uh, post postulate that the entire community of money users decides among coinage. He held that money in the property of the commonwealth Nicholas Resmi, A Treatise on the Origin, Nature, Law, and Alterations of Money. On a free market, the money owner can assert his property rights smoothly and swiftly. Each person can no longer trust a minter a simply stop using A coins and begin to use the coins of minter B. Thus, he leaves the A community and joins the B community. Competition in coinage is no panacea. Abuses are always possible, and in many cases, they cannot easily be repaired. The virtue of competition is that, is that it offers the prospect of, minimization, of minimizing the scope of possible abuses. And its great charms is that it involves the entire community of money users, not just the appointed or self-appointed office holders. Down here on earth, this seems to be all we can hope for. Part 2. Certificates physically disconnected from money. If certificates may add value to the bullion, then certificates may have value on their own. Therefore, they can also be traded without being physically integrated with the precious metal to which they certify the quality. Then they have money, then they are money substitutes. Issuing such a money substitute was the generally accepted practice in the cities of Amsterdam and Hamburg for almost two centuries. The Bank of Amsterdam, established in 1609, issued paper notes that certified that the holder of the note was the legal owner, and so on and so on, of, of so and so much fine silver deposited in the vaults of the bank. 
these banknotes could be redeemed at any time at the counters of the bank on the simple demand of the present owner. It is not necessary for us to dwell here on the nuances of early bank money. The most accessible presentation is in Adam Smith and Wealth Nations. As a consequence, there, they were traded in lieu of the silver itself. Rather than exchanging physical silver, people made their purchases with these banknotes that certified ownership of a sum of silver deposited at the bank. Apart from paper notes, the main types of such substitutes are token coins, certif certificates of deposits, checking accounts, credit cards, and electronic bank accounts on the internet. Despite the physical variety of these types, each of them feature three different characteristics, intermediation, titles, and the holdings of reserves. For most of the problems we will discuss in the present work, these common features are more important than the differences. For abbreviates, for abbreviates' sake, we will therefore mostly address the case of banknotes. In certain important respects, banknotes differ from other money substitutes. We will discuss these differences at the appropriate place in part two. Certification in the present case is not as integral as in the case of imprints that are struck into the money materials itself. The regular coin that we discussed above, rather the money substitute related to the quantity of money that is removed from the eyes of the partners to the exchange. The money itself is held at some other place, namely at a bank or treasury department, or whichever other organization has issued the certificate. Thus, there is in the present case not only monetary intermediation in the weak sense that all that a third party certifies the quantities of money exchanged by the other two parties, but also in the strong sense that this third party actually physically controls the money at the time of the exchange. Furthermore, money substitutes do not merely certify the physical existence of a certain amount of precious metals. They are also a legal title to that amount. The rightful owner of a one ounce of silver banknote, for example, is the rightful owner of one ounce of silver deposited in the vault of the institution that issued the banknote. Finally, the money supplies held by the issuer of the substitutes are called the reserves. This terminology is established in the economic science, but it should be used in some caution. Many students of money and banking believe that certificates such as books, book entries and bank accounts are the real monies because they are actually used in daily exchanges. Whereas the money held by the institutions that make the account entries are just the reserves. But the truth is quite different. In all such cases, that so-called reserves are in fact the real money, whereas the account entries are only money substitutes. On, only also needs to keep in mind one also needs to keep in mind that objects like banknotes can have very different economic natures. Today's virtu virtually all banknotes are government-enforced paper monies, but in former times, they were usually certificates for gold or silver. The U.S. Federal Reserve notes had been gold certificates since August 1971. Under the 1944 Bretton Woods system, foreign central banks could redeem them until 1971. When the system collapsed, or since then, they have, they have been paper money. Thus, although... One, uh, although on the level of their private physical appearance, there remained unchanged dollar notes that change the economic nature. Similarly, a token coin bear more physical resemblance to a gold coin than to a paper certificate. But from an economic point of view, paper certificates and token coins are in one class of phenomena. They are both substitutes that are physically disconnected from money. The coin per se here is irrelevant. In particular, notice that tokens also need to be distinguished from coins that contain a more or less amount of previous metals or in alloy. 
In the later case, the, certif the certificate is still physically connected with the money material. In short, the physical aspect of things are often irrelevant. From an economic point of view, the point has been stressed. For example, in Oswald and Nell Bruining, Geldwesen und Währung im Streite der Zeit. And that is money and currency in the dispute over time. What are the advantages and disadvantages of certificates disconnected from the money itself? The main advantage is that the cost or of storage, transportation and certification, minting, can be reduced. The main disadvantage is that the potential of abuse is greater than in the case of coinage. Fraudulent banksters can can embezzle on the property of their customers far more easily than fraudulent minters. A look at the history of institutions reveals that this temptation was virtually impossible to resist, especially when certification was not competitive. In the case of the Bank of Hamburg, it took almost 150 years before abuse set in, at any rate, before it became manifested. Other banksters fell from the grace much more quickly. For example, the goldsmiths, who in the mid-1600s had taken over the, certifications business, the certification business in the city of London after the English king had robbed the gold deposited in the tower, very soon started using the deposits in their lending operations. Thus, they turned themselves into fractional reserve banksters, meaning that only a part, a fraction, of their issues was covered by underlying money reserves. In short, the potential abuse of substitutes is a very considerable disadvantage. One may therefore justly doubt that on a free market, they could have gained any large circulation. Even David Ricardo, the great champion of paper currency, admitted that it was unlikely that such a substitutes could withstand the competition of coin. The only sure way to bring paper money into circulation was to impose them on the citizenry. If those who use one and two and even five pound notes should not have the option of using guineas, there can be little doubt that they would prefer. David Ricardo in Proposals for an Economical and Secure Currency in Ricardo's eyes, free choice in money could not be permitted because consumer preference for gold and silver coins would mean that to indulge a mere caprice, a most expensive medium, would be sustained for one of little value. We will deal with the costs of commodity money in a subsequent uh, section. But our point is not to speculate about the significance that paper certificates would have on the free market. We merely wish to point out that paper certificates and token coins might conceivably play a role here and that they have been used very widely in the past, though very often under some sort of imposition. In a free society, the market participants would constantly constantly weigh the advantages and disadvantages of the various certification permits. It is true that they would not be able to prevent all abuses. But again, the point is that, that the competitive system minimizes the possible damages. Piers, thank you very much here for joining me after this reading for The Ethics of Money Production by Jörg Guido Holtzmann, published by the Mises Institute. Thank you very much for listening and see you on the next show. Bye-bye.